In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we are going to talk about shorts, longevity of pathogens in containers, magnifying glass specifications, branches dropping on you in woodland, umbrellas, and the resin content of bow drill components. Welcome, welcome to episode 55 of Ask Paul Kirtley, where I answer your questions about wilderness bushcraft, survival skills, and outdoor life. And I will mention it again, please follow on Instagram as well as subscribing to this video series or to the podcast series, however you like to consume this. Instagram, lots of little nuggets there, things that I share, things that you can easily consume on your tea break or just before you uh, finish work or after you finish work on the bus home or whatever, just I try and share like a mini blog post there of um, a photo and some context in the text. Um, everything from tree and plant ID to basic bushcraft skills to what we're up to. Um, and I try and keep it fairly current and share something every day if I can, if I've got some sort of connectivity, which I don't always have, of course, but um, there you go. That's the nature of what I do. But Instagram is the place to get more stuff from me if you want things on a pretty much daily basis. All right, let's get into the questions because the midges are out. I'm in Sussex. It's a nice Sunday evening when I'm recording this, um, but I've got little gnats or midges um, feasting on me. So a question from Louis, and this is a voicemail question via SpeakPipe. Not a lot of those coming in. Let's see if we can get this to work. Hi, Paul. Uh, love the show and the great work you do. Uh, I've been listening for quite some time. It helps uh, boring bus journeys and studying at the moment. So I thought I'd uh, I'd send you a question. Uh, as the summer months are approaching, looking into buying a pair of shorts for small hikes, general camp life and bushcraft. Do you have any recommendations for brands, etc.? And also, is waxing a good idea? All right. Thanks so much, Louis. Well, Louis, I think you're asking about waxing the canvas or waxing the cotton not waxing your legs, but <laughs> you never know. You never know. If you're a cyclist, waxing your legs could be good. I don't know, maybe. Um, but shorts, um, I would say if you're out in the summer, you just want something that's gonna be tough, something that's gonna dry relatively quickly. I like shorts that have, um, I'm not one for the short shorts that certain people like. Um, <laughs> not naming any names. I like kind of cargo short so almost like a pair of cargo pants or a pair of fial raven type pants that have been cut off just above the knee that have still got the pockets that i like to have and that i can arrange my kit but that just allows a bit more fresh air on the lower leg helps with your feet not getting as sweaty as well all that kind of stuff helps um, so a couple of brands that I've used over the years um, that I quite like, uh, Fjall Raven will do, make some shorts um, that are kind of like the trousers, and Carhartt as well. Um, they're one workwear, relatively tough, cotton shorts. I've used those a fair amount, um, use them in more tropical places, use them in Australia, use them in Africa, um, where it's appropriate. Now, wearing shorts in some places even in hot climates is not necessarily appropriate you might not want to have your lower legs um, exposed of course you might even need to wear small gaiters between the top of your boots and the bottom of your trousers to stop nasties ticks and whatnot getting in but if you are wearing shorts it's okay to wear shorts those are the two places i look still have some carhartt shorts that i've had for years that i really like and they they work well in the same sort of way that my typical outdoor trousers work as well in terms of pocket arrangements getting a decent belt on etc and come in for a range of natural colors as well so hopefully that helps and waxing if we're being serious there's not a lot of point because um, if you're wearing them because it's warm you know it doesn't really matter if they get wet 
they're going to dry quickly. Um, waxing doesn't really stop the, the fabrics getting that wet anyway. I, I've, I don't tend to wax my Fjall Raven trousers typically once I've washed them just because it takes, it's a lot of effort for, for not a lot of gain. Um, so that's my, life's too short. <laughs> you like the pun there. <laughs> Okay, longevity of pad. I don't know why I found that question so humorous, Louis. I didn't, I'm not taking the mickey out of you. It's just, there's a few things that amuse me about that. Um, question from Rob, aka Wolf Walker. And his question is um, as follows. Uh, Hi, I've been following since before the Ask Paul Kirtley episodes, which is good. Thank you. Thank you. Long time listener, first time caller perhaps. Um, thank you for them as well. Such great knowledge as they have been very helpful to me. My question has to do with water filtration. I see a lot of people blowing into their dirty water containers to puff them up to make them easier to fill, such as the plastic bag that comes with a Sawyer filter. I wonder how long are the organisms harmful for? Is it safe to make contact with the dirty bag after it's been dried? Personally, I cup my hand over the top of this type of bag before blowing into it no matter how long it's been sitting but i'm curious thank you for your time um yeah well certainly if there's any moisture still in there there could still be pathogens in the water that's in there if it's dirty water it's dirty water pathogens aren't necessarily going to go away um, some pathogens particularly protozoa can live outside of a host for a long time with virtually no moisture and so they're going to be around for quite some time and equally you might even if there's bacteria in there they might even um, they might even grow in number. Um, I, I know of cases where people have had um, water that's been drinkable, and then there's been a small amount of something in there which they've left the bottle for some time, and I'm talking weeks. They've drunk out the bottle, and then they be become ill. So bacteria and other pathogens can multiply in the water in water that's left as well not just stay the same um, so i would not be bringing my mouth into contact with any container that has had dirty water that's got pathogenic organisms in it in direct contact um, at all at any point in time magnifying glass specifications and this is from mr jennison mr jennison asks it would seem to me that one of the indestructible tools for starting a fire would be a magnifying glass. I've never seen any data on the best magnifying factor or diameter for, for such an item. Do you have any data experience with this? Sincerely. Um, well, I wouldn't necessarily say they're indestructible because some of them are made of glass and it's quite easy to break them um, under the right circumstances. So that would be one thing. Um, but generally, there are two factors in how effective the well there's there's more but two big factors um you know how effective a lens is for fire lighting by focusing the rays of the sun one is the magnification so if you're putting a certain amount of light into it um how small is the dot that you can create with it that's largely down to the magnification um and then the other factor is is how big is the lens how what's the incident amount of light that's hitting the lens that's been focused into that spot. You could have a lens that has a smaller area with the same magnification that isn't going to give you as much heat, if you like, as a larger lens with the same magnification because it's catching more light and focusing it down into an area. So those are the two main factors. We, before we start talking about, you know, the transmission of light through the lens, of course, um, that's a minor factor with a magnifying glass. Um, you know, there will be some energy lost as the light goes through the lens and there might be some internal reflection and the light doesn't get where it's meant to and all those sorts of things. But generally, if it's a half decent quality piece of glass, it's the size, the area, um, and the and the and the magnification, and you can work out. We can divide one by the other to kind of give you a factor, if you like, um, in terms of how small the dot's going to be. So those are the two things. So if you get a like a big kind of Inspector Cluedo um, magnifying glass, they work 
great. They work really, really well. Um, but equally, you can get a small lens, a small hand lens that's designed for um, looking at really small things like a jeweler's loop or something. And it's a small lens, but it's quite high magnification. So it's going to come down into quite a fine into quite a fine dot. So have a play around and, and see, see what you can what you can do. But uh, a, a normal kind of magnifying lens that you might have for just looking at things more closely in nature, that's going to serve you quite well in terms of lighting, uh, lighting fires as well. And as you say, it's more that, you know, you use the word indestructible, something that folds into its own little case is probably going to be the most indestructible type. So I've got one that goes into my pocket. It's about that sort of size, um, maybe about an inch and a half, two inches, two inches across at most, four centimeters across. And it's got a little plastic sleeve and it folds out the plastic sleeve. And then the sleeve is the handle, if you like. And that's quite a good one. It cost me a few pounds on Amazon and, and it works fine, even in the UK where the sun's not always that strong. <sighs> branches dropping in woodland which is never a good thing particularly if you're underneath them and this comes from I don't have a name on this Jamie I think Jamie yes the bottom of the question um, hi Paul still living all the content you produce when you are in dense woodland does the potential for falling branches factor into where you decide to walk or set up camp for the night? I've heard that some tree species are prone to shedding branches after a period of dry weather. Many thanks, Jamie from Fife, Scotland. Um, it's not necessarily just in dry weather, Jamie. There are some species which are quite prone. Um, so for example, I'm sitting here, I've got a birch tree there, I've got some Norway spruce there, I've got quite a lot of Norway spruce and a bit of birch behind me. There's a lovely... <coughs> excuse me i think i just fall, <laughs> swallowed a, a midge there's a lovely beech tree over there but i'm not going to sit underneath it and record one of these because beech trees are one of the species that are prone to dropping branches and you get this lovely open area so you can see behind me now all the brackens coming up here and it'll get denser than this in 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 here uh, as the summer progresses and you come in here and you want to set up and you think, oh, well, there's this lovely open area over there underneath that beech tree where all the leaves are. That might be quite comfy to sleep on as well, but that's not a good place to, to sleep. Branches have a tendency to drop for various reasons from beech. Um, it's quite short grained wood. Um, the branches tend to be quite long and a bit spindly for the length. There's a lot of weight there. Um, it's prone to infection. It can be damaged by wind over the winter as well and then as the sap rises in the in the spring and the leaves get heavier they can fall off um, there's a number of reasons why beech trees are prone to dropping limbs and they do and don't camp under them and personally i don't even tend to loiter under them for too long frankly um, oaks also surprisingly given the reputation that oaks have for strength I've seen some really big limbs come off um, English oak trees in the woods and I'd be, uh, I'd be reticent to sleep under one of those um, for that reason and I'm not talking like a small sapling I'm talking about something that's got sizable enough branches that if they drop on you are going to hurt and damage you um, and so that's something I would avoid um, and those are the main ones, you're in Fife, those are the main ones that you need to be worrying about. Um, big oaks and big beeches avoid being underneath them. So yes, I absolutely do look at what's there in terms of those species. And then just generally what you want to be doing when you get into an area is, of course you want to be choosing an area that's suitable for sleeping on, it's not going to fill up with water, there's not a wasp's nest at the base of a tree and all of those normal things. I won't go into all the details on what you need to look for. Um, but one of the th in the context of this question, you should also look up. People don't always look up and there might be perfectly viable tree here, but the top of the tree is dead for some reason. The crown is dead and if you get some wind, that may come down. Equally, there might be a partially fallen tree over there which is laying against another tree and if they start to move it might slide down again you need to think about that and assess that also if it's particularly wet the ground is wet what can start to happen is roots can start to loosen and if that's combined with wind you get heave um, in the root bowl and the whole thing can be moving around 
and you start to notice areas of ground that are moving up and down or, root, or roots starting to appear, you want to avoid those trees as well. And certainly you want to avoid being on the downwind side of those because I've seen trees come down because of that as well. Perfectly good trees otherwise, but the ground gets so saturated combined with strong wind that it's enough to basically prize and, and, and tear the tree out of the ground, unfortunately. So those are other things that I look for. Dead branches, dead crowns, half fallen trees, things that were overhanging where I might want to sleep. And then depending on weather conditions, what's going on with wind and water as well. Those are all things you need to be looking out for. Speaking of wind and wet, a question about umbrellas. Uh, who's this from? Robin! Robin! You've got a hat-trick, Robin, and that's just complete chance. Third question on a show in a row. Live asked Paul Kirtley. Last asked Paul Kirtley, you asked me about uh, philosophy of bushcraft, and here you're asking me about umbrellas. And this is from a little while ago. Um, his question is, <laughs> an umbrella is a vital piece of bushcraft equipment. We'll come back to that. Um, I have found, okay, personal experience, on a warm summer's night where I decide not to use a tarp, it has been used to keep light showers off my head. The rest of me is in the bivvy bag. It can be used to carry things, sail a canoe, signal with Morse code, not that I can remember any now, um, but what else? Can you think of any other uses for this vital piece of equipment? Regards, Robin. P.S. The shows are great. Thank you for giving up your time to put them out. Well, you're very welcome, Robin, as always, and it was great speaking with you at uh, the Bushcraft show. And yeah, so is it a vital piece of Bushcraft equipment? No. Um, is it something that could be potentially very useful combined with other pieces of camping equipment? Absolutely. Um, I always remember reading uh, Nicholas Crane's book, Clear, Clear Waters Rising, and I can't remember the name that he had. I, I've probably mentioned this before. I, I recall that I've discussed this before. He had a name for his umbrella that he used, and he liked to use an umbrella um, on his walk that he did from the uh, Atlantic coast all the way to uh, Istanbul through the mountains of, of Europe. Uh, quite a walk. Um, one of those walks that I kind of always fancied doing but have never found the time just to go off and do that that type of long long walk but it would be would be a great experience I'm sure. Um, but yeah and he found an umbrella very very useful for that and yeah I've heard of people using umbrellas to just pop up over your head. Clearly if it's too windy that can be an issue it can blow away but in wind yep you can use them for sailing a canoe and I've done that and that's useful. Um, having uh, using them kind of like a, a, a mirror if you can put a silver survival um, bag type material on the inside with a with a lamp in the center again you can use them to signal um, i think that might be what you're alluding to with morse code um, collecting water is another one you you know turn it in turn it upside down and use it for collecting water in a rainstorm if you're short of water um, that would be another use that i could think of um, where there might not be much surface water but you get a downpour you can collect quite a lot and then you can decant it into into a water bottle um, so so yeah I think they can be useful I like the idea of just having them as a quick put out put up over your head um, shower proof thing because that is the issue with sleeping out in if you're not using a zipped bivy bag um, or double hoop bivy bag or a bivy bag with a zip at the top um, lying down in the rain is problematic and I mentioned before I th think it was a question about the the snug pack special forces bivy um, from our friend in Austria I think it was oh no from near Berlin from Berlin um, and his question was about using the snug pack special forces and could you sleep out in it and my answer was yeah absolutely you can but in the rain where the water's going to get in is not the zip it gets in the hole at the top and the best way I found with with bivy bags is to lie on your front the bit that is the hood then cowls over your face but I prefer sleeping on my back or my side, sleep lying on your front, face down in a rainstorm isn't the most pleasant way to spend the night. So yeah, I like the idea of using an umbrella in that way, if that's, if that's what you want to do and, you want, and you're happy carrying an umbrella. It makes quite a good walking stick otherwise, I guess. So yeah, no, I like that idea. Um, good stuff. Last one. 
resin content in bow drill components. And this is from Scott. This is from a little while ago. Apologies, Scott, it's taken me a while to get around to this one, um, but it's a good one. Um, first of all, I'd like to say you, I enjoy your blog. Keep up the good work. I've developed good skills over the years when it comes to the bow drill method of fire lighting and have become quite successful at it. Um, I follow all the guidelines that you stated in episode 21 and the linked article on the subject of that episode. I too am a firm believer in practicing with the most abundantly available materials, which brings me to my question. I live in New Brunswick, Canada, and the most common tree is balsam fir. I have used it extensively. However, on average, I will only be successful about one in three times when it doesn't work because the drill is screeching excessively due to high resin content. The problem is I just wasted time preparing the components only to realize that it contains too much resin. So I find some more dead, dry, firm balsam fir, make another bow drill set and try again. I will repeat this until I find a set that works. Once I do, it works very well, indeed. Is there a way to check for resin content to save me the trouble of trial and error? Thanks, and much appreciated. Well, you, I have used balsam fir um, for, for bow drill in Canada and I found it works very well. Um, I found I use small dead standing uh, trees in amongst the forest understory that hadn't uh, made it as it were, but was still standing. And I was able to get the, the spindle from higher up and the hearth from a little bit lower down. And that's always, and I say always on the few occasions I've done it, that's always worked for me. Um, that's in Ontario specific area same type of trees done a few times so my sample size is small you've got a bigger data set than me but what i would say is that screeching i don't think is necessarily specific to resin content i think it can often be down to moisture content um, although it can also be down to the ends cracking it seems um, but that could also be related to moisture content but we'll come we'll set that aside but what i would say in terms of resin content there is a with with any needled resinous species there is a difference if you cut into something that's green like fresh and i know you're not using fresh stuff but if you cut into something that's green and fresh it's got a real resinous smell to it it's got a real specific smell to it and then as it's it's dead and dry it's been dead and dry for longer that diminishes and it's got a different smell to it and i would i would say perhaps one thing to do is try and when you've got one that works well is try and remit, is, is try and get some data uh, you know anecdotal as it is but smell it and see how it smells when it's right um, and then maybe also compare that to to how it smells when it isn't right and and try and build up a, a little smell database also in terms of assessing moisture content and we can include resin content it isn't always easy to do with your hands it can be easy to do with your lips does it feel warm does it feel cold that's a good way because your lips are more sensitive than your fingers so as long as it's not toxic which clearly it isn't you can with with relatively dry lips put your lips on there and does it feel slightly cold slightly damp maybe even or does it feel really bone dry um, that's one way of of assessing whether or not it's it's properly dry um, and that would be something that I would that I would try. So maybe get some data on smell, get some sense of how it feels on your lips as well. That would be something that I would try and correlate with when it works and when it doesn't work and try and up your success rate that way. Those would be a couple of things that I would be looking at. And consistency as well. I mean, clearly if it's, if it's not long being dead, it might be firmer and it's been dead longer then it might just be a little bit more prone to working. And it's not necessarily just down to moisture content, it could also be just down to consistency. So there's that variable there as well, I think. Um, in my experience with some of the other Pinaceae, um, some of the Pinus species, the pines in particular, um, it's often down to slight changes in consistency, whether it works well or whether it's a bit of a struggle. That brings us to the end of episode 55. More good questions there. Um, 
stuff on techniques, stuff on nature, um, and a few bits on equipment as well. Um, so that's fine. Hopefully that's a useful spread and that's given you some things to think about. Please keep the questions coming in as you're out and about over the summer doing different things. As questions spring to mind, please get the questions in to me because I am getting through the questions now. Some of these questions are from a while ago. I'm getting caught up and if you've got questions, now's a good opportunity to get them answered fairly soon because I know I don't have a huge backlog at the moment. So speak pipe. I like the, the voice questions. They're always good. It's always good to hear people's voices. Um, Instagram I like with the, with the pictures. Um, gives some pictorial context. Uh, Twitter is a good way of getting a concise question in. And of course you can always email. Just make sure it's got Ask Paul Kirtley in the title or in the context uh, of the of the actual question so that my inbox filters it, it puts it into a file of ask paul kirtley questions and then when i'm s selecting them to put them across onto onto my phone to prepare these sessions it's easy for me to find the questions so um please like and subscribe if you're watching via youtube videos please subscribe to the audio podcast and also if you're on my blog if you're not on my mailing list why on earth not get into the corner get your email in there because you will get updates on all of the content that's coming out whether it's blogs audio podcasts interview podcasts whether it's uh, videos ask paul kirtley's special stuff you will get all of those emails so if you really like most of what i do make sure you are on my email list. And if you're not watching this on my blog, then go to my blog now, paulkirtley.co.uk and pop your email address in there and I'll send you lots of the good stuff as and when it comes out, you'll be the first to hear about it. So thanks again for your attention. Thanks for your questions. I'm gonna go now because I'm starting to get eaten here and uh, not badly. I mean, people worry about bugs in the UK, but with the exception of the Scottish midge, and I'm a long way from Scotland here. Um, there's nothing much to worry about, but uh, I'll stop scratching myself in front of you and uh, leave it at that. Thanks again. Take care of yourselves. Enjoy the summer and uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, as I know there's some of you further south, and uh, I will see you soon. I'm gonna be canoeing um, on Windermere soon. I uh, might do an episode from there if I get the chance. So keep an eye out from that different venue, I would imagine, on the next episode. So see you there. Enjoy wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Stay safe and I'll see you soon. Cheers.